can't have a good shape if I believe one set of facts and you believe some others. Right. I guess uh, we're about ready to get started now. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, today we have Mr. Steve Holland, um, research fellow in the Integrated Vehicle Health Management Group reporting to both GM Global Research and Development and GM Global Quality. He's currently responsible for technology strategy and diagnosis and prognosis as applied to onboard vehicle applications as well as for warranty and service. Steve joined GM in 1970 while still a graduate student at GM Institute and subsequent, subsequently became involved in early industrial research on robotics, vision, and computer-based manufacturing. He later led all GM's computer research activities in machine perception, artificial intelligence, and advanced computing methods from 81 to 91. And from 91 to 96, he directed the GM robotics development efforts from 97 to 2002. He served as the founding director of the GM Controls robotics and welding activity and was responsible for robotics and welding support in all GM plants from 02 to 06. Uh, he served as the director of the Manufacturing Systems Research Lab and chief scientist for global manufacturing. He's a fellow of IEEE and served as an IEEE distinguished lecturer. In 98, he received the Joseph F. Engelberger Award for his contributions to the advancement of science of robotics and the service of mankind. He has served in a variety of industry, academic, and government advisory boards and is a registered professional engineer. He's been a member of the board of directors of the Math Counts Foundation since 2008, and he has a bachelor's in electrical engineering from GMI and master's in computer science from Stanford. Let's welcome our speaker. Well, it's nice to see such a large audience. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'd like to thank you for inviting me here. Um, I'm actually the guy who hired Sam into GM Research back in 1984, the year of uh, George Orwell's book. Um, but contrary to that uh, depressing book, uh, it was really an exciting time in uh, computer science. And so I've known Sam for nearly 30 years. Um, Sam's always been uh, followed the beat of a different drummer, I think, than uh, a lot of people at uh, GM. Perhaps you've noticed that as well. Um, um, he's always been intolerant of any kind of bureaucratic things as well. And I think in my role, since I was the manager, I think it was sort of my job to get rid of the barriers for <coughs> research. And uh, actually, I came to think that that really is an important job of anybody in management to strike down the barriers that prevent the team from accomplishing their goals. Um, Sam's asked me to do a lot of strange things over the years. Um, I'm going to give you just one example, but uh, once he thought it was a really good idea, there was a, a young lady in our department who was about to get married and had all of her family coming from out of town, and she waited a little bit long to line up the pastor who was going to do the wedding ceremony. So it turned out that she went ahead and got married in the uh, city hall but all the family was coming and there was nobody to conduct the ceremony. And Sam said, well, obviously I should have done it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there I was uh, marrying somebody in my department or conducting the ceremony at least. And uh, it was a, a very exciting experience for me. And uh, I remember it very well because I was just about to read the lines, which were the same lines that she had used in her actual wedding. And uh, as it, you know, it came time for me to read that, they turned off all the room lights because it was going to be by candlelight. So uh, here I'm uh, <laughs> by the candles. And some of the people in the family they thought were a little too elderly to even explain this to them. Obviously, the parents knew, but the grandparents didn't. Know. So right after the ceremony was over, the grandparents came over to say what a nice service they thought. And, they just wouldn't leave, but finally the parents came and like, took them away from me, so I survived. So I'm not trying to say this talk is as unusual as that, <laughs> but it is a little unusual, and I've never done a talk like this, so bear with me. But what I'm going to try to do is talk about a little bit about my history and some things that I think are relevant. Sam said that some of you are at the stage in your career where you're looking for research topics for your PhD thesis, so 
I'm going to think back over my years of research and try to tell you some of the things that were memorable to me that might be useful to you. I hope some of them are useful to you. And then I'm going to end with some sort of lessons that are more relevant, I think, from a management point of view, because I assume some of you will, at some point in your career, find yourself in that role as well, in addition to sort of the research role. So um, uh, I uh, grew up in Detroit, in a middle class neighborhood. And uh, uh, in my high school days, I thought I was going to be a microbiologist. And I came to that conclusion because I really, really liked my biology teacher in high school. And he did cool things. Like he sent me to the National Microbiology College when I was in high school in Detroit. And it was just very, very impressive to me. But along about that same time, I had also been involved in Boy Scouts, the whole experience, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Explorers. And uh, when I got into the Explorer part, which is like for the older kids, the high school age kids, my particular post was sponsored by a company called Harlem Electric, which is a local company. And um, this would have been in the mid-60s, late 60s. And they had a computer. And nobody had computers back then. And they let us play with their computers. And so I taught myself how to program. And I could use a computer. And, and nobody had computers back then. So, and that uh, really convinced me that that's what I wanted to do. So when it came time for college, I looked at um, uh, several different colleges. My brother had gone to GMI, which had this great appeal uh, that it's basically free because it's a co-op based school. And I knew about it from my brother, so I ended up doing that. And uh, after that, uh, GM was nice enough to send me for my master's degree at Stanford. And I pretty much could have gone any place in the world I wanted to, assuming I could get in. And, Stanford was my first choice, and I was fortunate to be able to go there. So that was a great experience for me. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the things in my undergraduate days that was remarkable to me was that um, I was co-oping at GM Research, and I would go to a different department every time I came back for a work assignment. And I always had this uh, experience that uh, I never quite knew enough about anything. I mean, I just had a class in maybe that topic, but I never quite knew enough. And it was in such a contrast for me, because many of the students I knew always would say, why would I ever want to learn this stuff? I'll never use it. And I was having an experience like, I never knew enough. So um, I think that speaks to the value of co-op work, work experience. And you're probably past that point, but I mean, I think that's useful, that you should seek out that kind of connection. And I think perhaps a lot of university students don't realize how much they can get from industry if they just pursue it. And just one example, but uh, I was involved with a group called uh, Triple M at Northwestern University. Um, and uh, I was involved in a project there where we were looking at uh, this diagnosis and prognosis area. And the students that were working on that project, not only did they research things on the internet and through other typical means, but they would call up people. And I recall one of the places they called the Xerox. And they actually got to talk to a vice president of Xerox. And in a sense, they got information that I couldn't have got as a GM employee. And it worked out really well from my perspective. But it's a big opportunity from your perspective. I mean, to some extent, I think it's true, you just have to go ask. I mean, not everybody's going to let you in, but you have this great opportunity <coughs> to uh, pursue it. Um, so I encourage you to do that. When I went to Stanford for the start of my master's degree, it was 1974, and uh, things were really hot and blossoming in the computer area at that time. So I think the very first email on an ARPANET style email was sent in 1971. I showed up there in 74. And on my first day, I had an email account and an ARPANET account. And I've had one ever since. So that was a long time before most people used email, but I've been fortunate to have that. And it was at a time when, uh, even back then, so this is 1974, if you would, uh, could go up to the Stanford AI lab and I could log on to a console there and type 
D20 and it would credit 20 cents into the vending machine, I could walk over to the vending machine and get something out of there, a drink or a candy bar or whatever. And I could, I could get a coffee and once a month it would send me a bill for whatever I ordered. And uh, I, I think um, practically my first day there, I probably told the system that I wanted to see articles from API and UP that had GM in it. I recall having to turn that off the second day because I got like 300 articles, not for General Motors, which is what I was thinking, but for GM of a sports team. And every article about sports refers to whatever the GM said. But my point is that even back then, 1974, you could already do that with what was the ARPANET. So the things that people think about today is the World Wide Web. I've been here for a long time. They were already digitized? Digitized, yes, they were getting live feeds from uh, uh, both, both API and UP, okay. and uh, you could search for any keyword in it, and it would just copy it into your email, 1974. And they had uh, Xerox graphics printers, which were the, you know, the dot matrix style kind that we have today for about $100, and there were probably 500,000 then. But, um, so anyway, it's a pretty exciting place at Stanford. Uh, my favorite teacher there was Don Knuth. And I was fortunate to have like four classes from him. My master's degree advisor was Vinton Cerf, who I didn't realize it then, but we now know him as the father of the internet. Um, there were little robots running around up in the hills above Stanford, which was kind of cool. Um, very exciting place. Uh, when, it, when I finished there, uh, I had the choice of going on somewhere for a PhD or coming back to GM, and that was a really hard decision for me. And I ended up coming back to GM, not pursuing my PhD, and it was because there was so much cool stuff going on that I just couldn't get weight get back to work to do it. So that's what I ended up doing. And GMR, GM Research at that time, had already done lots of cool things. I think one of the first computer-like devices in the world was done there in the 40s. It was called SAMJAC, and that was an acronym for Slow as Molasses in January Computer. <laughs> um, and it was basically a calculator that they had fixed up so they could run the program on this mechanical calculator to crank out uh, computations. Uh, they also, in 1956, did the world's first operating system. Check that up in Wikipedia if you don't believe me. Um, they had uh, 19, 19, this is 19, oh, 19, this is early 70s. Uh, they had uh, full screen editors. Uh, back when nobody had computers, we had computers, we had full screen editors. And uh, our full screen editor would bring an IBM mainframe to its knees because you could poke with the light pen commanding the mainframe, and it would just bring the whole mainframe to a, a dead standstill. But it was pretty pretty cool. We had uh, pool games that are kind of like uh, what you see on video games today that we used when we had family and friends in, that you could actually play on the screen with the light and play pool, and it would simulate the motion of the pool balls. So lots and lots of cool stuff. Um, the very first summer I was there, I drove an electric Opal, 1970. We had uh, fuel cell vehicles running about that time. I didn't drive that, but uh, uh, I had a chance to work on uh, and actually write some of the software for the first relational database management system, one of the first. Um, so lots of things. So um, one of the projects we worked on was uh, the Star 100 computer, which was going to be our master computer to do all of our CAD design. We had an entire department of people building this operating system. We built our own operating system and our own programming language compilers for that computer. And we finished our part, and it was about time to go from the prototype machine to the real machine. And we found out that um, at that time, Control Data Corporation, which built it, had never simulated the logic, and the logic didn't work. So when you scaled it up to the full vector machine, basically only ran in vector mode like a tenth of a percent of the time, so it was 
just basically didn't work. So um, <clears throat> not everything works the way you would hope. Uh, one, one piece of advice that you hear lots of people say this, and certainly not unique to me, but the idea fail early, fail often, and fail cheap. And you know, you guys shouldn't be afraid of failure. Failure you should see as the way you learn. And uh, so failure is actually a very good thing. Um, a kind of a rule of thumb in the research world is that if you imagine something costing, say, a million dollars in the research world, you can kind of figure it's going to cost $10 million to ship it over to development. And it's going to cost $100 million when you ship it over to production. And I think when you look at the potential savings of an idea you have, if you imagine that you can get back 10 times what it's going to cost you to develop it, that's not worth the trip. So that's not, that's not setting the sights high enough for research. You have to look for more impact than that, or it's not worth doing the work. Um, in the uh, sort of the product engineering world, it's probably uh, even more extreme. That was the research example, one times, 10 times, 100 times. That's a good way to get your mind straight. But in the product engineering world, you have a similar phenomenon that things that you do at design time, you can make lots of mistakes, fix them, they're easy to fix, cheap to fix, but if you let them go and you get into production, so imagine GM, you make a design decision a couple of years before start of production. If it's wrong, you can fix it, no problem, cheap, fast, easy to do. If you let that vehicle get in production, you know, now you've got to go all over the country just to find these and everything gets hugely expensive. So uh, it's definitely early to do this stuff early. Um, getting back to uh, uh, GM Research, when I started there, we had uh, in a machine perception lab, I was working in a computer vision project. So uh, this is uh, mid-70s. Um, we used a PDP-1145. It cost about a half a million dollars. It had uh, 512 kilobytes of memory, and its hard drives were one megabyte each. So the uh, memory in my phone is 16,000 times of that. It's hard to believe. But one thing I find that students today don't have a good appreciation for, let me just give you an example. So think back to this com computer with 512 kilobytes of memory and megabyte hard drive. You know, this big giant thing this big. Um, on that computer, we ran a computer vision algorithm which could find parts on a moving conveyor belt. We tracked the moving conveyor belt, so we watched it as it was moving. And we controlled uh, what's called the Stanford Arm electric robot completely from that computer to go out and align with that part, follow it down the conveyor belt, pick it up, and then put it in a standard place. And Today, on a computer like that, most computer science students would look at it and think like it's just a toy. You could never do anything. You couldn't even boot the simplest of operating systems on that computer anymore. And yet, you could do all that. So I mean, we did tricks. We used special lighting, and we did things to make it easier. But uh, you can actually do quite a bit with a lot less than you find sure, in all the labs around here. Um, it so happened uh, that through people's changes and moving, I ended up moving pretty quickly into a management role and took over as a group leader for this machine perception group. And not all that much later, actually when I turned 30 years old, I got an executive assignment where I was put in charge of all the computer science research in GM, which was a really cool job. And that's about the time Sam came. So um, uh, I left research uh, later on and went to be director of robotics. And uh, at that time, uh, GM was doing a lot of first type developments in robotics. Uh, you may not know, but the first robot ever used in any industrial application was a GM application, a material handling robot. The first spot welding robot ever used in the world, which is the number one application right now in the auto industry, was a GM. The first line of spot welding robots, the first painting robot, first intelligent assist device, the first cobot, all were done in GM plants. 
So it was a pretty cool time. Uh, one example from that, and uh, I'll move on, but one of the things that we were doing back then was robotic simulation. And at that time, there were no commercial packages. Later on, commercial packages became really good, and we dumped ours and went to the commercial ones because it's so hard to keep something like that maintained. But already, in those first robot simulation packages, we observed something that I call uh, user seductive graphics. And what we found, and this was uh, shocking to me, is that you could put up a picture, a beautiful color picture, very realistic, that showed the robot doing some operation in an assembly plant. And if you took it out and showed it to the people in the plant, they basically would lay down and give up. The, oh, the computer says it's that way, it is that way. They wouldn't challenge it, they wouldn't argue it because the pictures were too good. The pictures were so realistic that it looked like truth. And yet we knew that there were all kinds of assumptions and approximations in what we were doing. And we didn't want them to just say, OK, that's right. We wanted to be challenged. Because when you do a simulation, of course, if you like inadvertently forget a column that's in the plant or some other physical object, you might not be able to reach the places that you think you can. And it's a danger, particularly today, the quality of the simulations and the graphics is so good, you can cause people to make really bad decisions by because they're so enamored by the beauty of the, the pictures and the graphics you show them. So it's, it's kind of an interesting concern. Um, OK, so I'm going to move on now to uh, some sort of semi-random topics that I think are relevant to project management. And uh, yes, sir? Remember, you did the CSNet. You really want to say something. What does it do internet? Um, I'm, not, I'm not exactly mm -hmm. sure what you mean when we hooked up to the internet. At that, the the CSNet, in those days, computer science departments, you know, that's on a network itself before the internet came along. So by CSNet, it's yeah, extremely so useful to get onto the net. Yeah, so uh, GM Research was early <coughs> user on the internet, and uh, we were able to pipe in through the uh, network in Ann Arbor, so they had a very high speed back home. And, yep, so uh, there were so many, so many things. But I'm going to move past that and move on. So I wanted to talk about project selection and management for a minute, and one of the people, speakers I heard uh, talk once, uh, his name is Lester Thoreau, who was the Sloan School at MIT. He was talking about wealth, and he said there's only three ways to generate wealth. You can mine it, grow it, or manufacture it. And he was sort of arguing against the uh, excessive US uh, attention to legal things and financial transactions of changing money from pile to pile and not actually doing anything that makes a difference in the world. Um, and so mine it, grow it, or manufacture it. And of those, the one opportunity that I think is still a great opportunity and largely ignored by people in US universities in general is the manufacturing area. Because it's such a great domain and you can have such huge impact on our society and the world. So I suggest that as an opportunity area for you to think about. In terms of manufacturing, um, I look back over the evolution of the design paradigms in the automotive world. I see the period from around 1900, the automotive industry was in this craft stage. Every car was basically handmade. <coughs> the parts were hand fitted together. And uh, it went along for some time that way. And uh, a guy named Henry Leland, who became the founder of Cadillac, which later became part of GM, uh, introduced this idea for interchangeable parts, which was taken from the gun industry. And that set up the possibility, actually, he won an award for that. It was the first time in the history that they took, uh, I think they took like four Cadillacs to London, England, and took them apart on the lawn, mixed up the parts, and then got some spare parts out of the shed and mixed those in, and then they put the cars back together and they actually started. And that had never been done before because they were all crap. But uh, anyway, getting the interchangeable parts opened the door for the next paradigm that Henry Ford introduced assembly line. And then much later, Taichi Ono came up with this idea of lean manufacturing, 
which not only pervaded the auto industry, but it pervaded all manufacturing, I would say all business. Uh, today, I think, this is my view, the paradigm we're in now has gone beyond lean, as one I call uh, real-time optimization. And the, the essence of the idea is that now sensors are cheap, computer communication networks are cheap, processing power is cheap, storage is cheap. You can take these large systems of whatever kind you want and use the real-time information to get a lot better performance out of that and increase the value of whatever it is you're doing. And I, I think that's the, um, the number one opportunity today in manufacturing is applying those concepts to get more out of what you already have by, by use of real-time information. Um, uh, one of the guys who was a leader of GM Research uh, was talking once about the difference between research management and engineering management, and I thought he had a really great comment, so I'm just going to share that with you. He said, in engineering, and I think you absolutely will see this in business today, that if people have a problem, the mindset of senior management is if you throw people and money at it, they're going to solve that problem. And the, this guy, his name was John Kaplan, his, he said, in research, the difference is you have to have an idea. That they're not going to, in research, they're not going to give you money and resources until you have a, a plausible idea that addresses that problem. And he said that's the key difference between sort of the research mentality and the more traditional sort of engineering mentality. And I think that's very much in line with the academic communities that you're seeking those ideas which are going to have actual impacts. And that's that. Um, in the early days, um, when Sam and I were at GMR, a lot of our projects were conducted in what we call the thread approach, and I recommend this to you. And our idea was that you need to study kind of the waterfront and understand the area, but then you have to pick a subset and go deep on that and work out the technical issues, but do it in context of the overall. And that kind of uh, approach works really well for presentations. So if you want to have a high impact presentation to somebody, to start out and lay out the upper level, the high level the waterfront <coughs> sort of view, and then take one thread way down deep to the technical details to illustrate the interesting <coughs> technical problems, but not losing the context, that's a very effective way to do it. <coughs> you hear people today talking about that in terms of T-shaped projects and T-shaped people, and I think it's all kind of the same idea. One of the pet peeves I had when I go to universities, this is going back probably 20 or 30 years ago, is I frequently heard them saying, you know, why won't you guys in industry tell us what your problems are? Just tell us what your problems are. We'd go solve them for you. And what, what those people didn't understand from my point of view is that being able to articulate the problem crisply, as, as they were looking for, is more than half of the work. Maybe that's three quarters of the work. And that's not possible to do if you don't go talk to the people who actually have the problems. <coughs> so I think it's the case that if you have a brilliant, <coughs> genius idea, no matter how fabulous it is, if you try to solve a real world problem with that idea, odds are really likely that it's not going to work <coughs> for some reason that you didn't anticipate, that you couldn't possibly know if you don't go talk to the people who live in that space, work in that space, and have those problems. So I encourage you to do that as well. Um, scale. Scale is another interesting one. Uh, scale, uh, lots of times in the academic world, uh, I think because of the constraints of laboratory space and resources available, you only get a chance to do you know, two or three or 10 or 20 or 100 experiments, and there's a big, big difference between, you know, 10 experiments and a few million. And that's going to the scale of real-world production is a, a sort of mind-bending sort of change. But you've got to be able to get out and think to that level. One of the cool things about working in a place like GM Research is that the scale of General Motors Corporation is so big that if you actually solve a problem 
that they're having in production, and then you, you save just a little bit, when you scale it up against a huge global production, you can very quickly be talking about a lot of money. And I've been fortunate in my career to be involved with several of these projects that are up to like the $100 million a year savings level. That's really exciting to uh, have that kind of impact. And you find it, you find it all over in the strangest of places. And uh, um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. One of the projects I worked on a long time ago, this was actually a group that was underneath my area. But they were looking at neural networks back when neural networks weren't really very popular. And we, were, we did a system called Predadvisor, which was a credit scoring system that GMAC used to sort of pre-screen customer credit applications. And that's one of those projects that we were able to save about almost $100 million in its first full year of use. And uh, it's because of this incredible scale multiplier. But it's, uh, it's fun. <coughs> a lot of the projects that are uh, enjoyable to work on are sort of at this bleeding edge. Uh, we've been involved in a lot of those. Sam will remember a company called Technomatics. Uh, we did this wonderful uh, expert system long, long ago called Engine, which was at that time probably one of the biggest expert systems in the world. And it knew most everything about just one engine that we made, just one engine. And the effort to keep it working and maintaining it just sort of killed us because we couldn't handle that burden of maintaining it. But it's certainly a, a fun thing to do. Uh, an interesting happened with the company Technomatics. Uh, we actually gave them three million dollars because we really liked their work and we wanted to see them do well. And we, we actually bought a small piece of the company, and uh, they had this strange problem that they had this money in the bank, but they were about ready to try to go public, and they couldn't spend the money because it would make their numbers look bad, and it would hurt them when they went public. So they didn't want to spend the money even though they had it sitting in the bank, because they were trying to show a return on their products. So as a result, they didn't grow very quickly, and they weren't able to capitalize on that. And they sat there with all this money in the bank, and then another company bought them, and the company that bought them had no money. They bought them through paper transactions because they wanted to get at their cash. And once they got at their cash, they squandered that, and then the whole company didn't do very well. But it's sort of a bizarre circumstance where these little companies can get in a situation where they, they've even got the right resources, but for one reason or another, can't take advantage of them and use them. So, um, another thing uh, that's uh, popped into my mind is you know how you go about predicting the future. And I like this quote from William Gibson that said, the future is already here. You just have to look around you. Just not even, he said it's just not evenly distributed. And you really, what he meant is you have to look out of your target domain and you see examples of it all around you. You just have to interpret it back in your space. And one guy who was really good at that and at one time gave me a, a, a procedure to better understand where the future was going in any given area. His name is Bill Perry, and he was at one time the US Secretary of Defense. And at one time, uh, he was the head of the DARPA organization. Uh, he worked as a consultant for GM Research for a few years once too, which is when I got to know him. But he had this idea called, uh, perhaps you've heard it, technological discontinuities. What he said was, for any of us, if you go to a particular area, like let's say you take a computer memory or processor speed or network bandwidth, it's very easy for anybody to sort of sit back and put a pretty reasonable estimate out of, of how that's going to play out in the next few years. It's just not that hard. I mean, you can all, if you did it, you'd all be quite close. You know, know enough you can do that. So you can take any area and you decide, well, what are the things that will drive performance in that area? And then for each of those, project what's going to happen, let's say the next whatever years, 10 years or 15 years, whatever you want. <clears throat> and that's part pretty easy. And then you sit down and you say, okay, well, if that was true, how would that change the world today? And that approach, I think, gives you a, a really good insight as to how things are going to change. So I recommend that as well. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the Heilmeyer questions. How many have heard of the Heilmeyer questions? I don't see any hands. You absolutely 
you have to, this you can look it up on the internet. Um, it's nine questions. These are the most important questions for any researcher on any project you'll ever do the rest of your life. And Heilmeier also was the head of DARPA at one time, and he was also a consultant to uh, GM Research. We had a group called Science Advisory Committee that he was a part of. But uh, I'm just going to read you his questions. But these questions are uh, intended for researchers to ask themselves and be prepared to answer when they try to present their thesis proposal or their business proposition or whatever it is they're going to do. So the first question is, what are you trying to do? Articulate the objectives without using jargon. A little hard to do. Not, not many people do that well. Then the second question is, how is it done today, and what are the limits of current practice? Third question is, what's new in your approach, and why do you believe that would be successful? Fourth one is, who would care about this? Fifth one is, if you were successful, what would the difference be? How would it you know, manifest itself? Sixth one, what are the risks and the payoffs? Be clear about that. Seventh one is, how much will it cost? Eighth one, how long will it take to do it? And the ninth one, which is one of the more interesting ones, I think, is what would the midterm and final exam be to check for your success? And if you can answer those questions in a technical presentation for a thesis or a business project or a company project in the summer, uh, it's going to go well. And you're going to have a good, uh, good experience. So. Um, so that's kind of a potpourri of things. Uh, today, what I'm doing, I, I, most of my career I've been in management. And uh, a few years ago, I went back to technical work. I'm in a group now that we call Integrated Vehicle Health Management. And what we're trying to do is put diagnostic and prognostic technology into our cars. And uh, we had uh, a lot of interesting success with that in manufacturing plants. And um, to give you a, an example, I, I don't know if you'll be able to appreciate this, but imagine you have a running plant that's been there for you know, forever, and you put in some new predictive capability, and uh, somehow or other, magically, at the end of just a couple weeks, the throughput of that plant rises by 7 to 8 percent. That's worth a lot of money, because you've got, you know, Perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars investment sitting there, and you've got thousands of people working every day, and all of a sudden, through this thing that I like to call real-time optimization, you can make that seven or eight percent more productive. No money spent, essentially no money spent. You just get more out now, and uh, that's the that's the kind of thing we'd like to be able to replicate in sort of a vehicle situation cars. And uh, uh, I don't want to belabor this, but um, you may have heard the term perceived quality. Uh, in the automotive business, there's been a long focus on quality. And in recent years, people have come to realize that the true quality, that if you measure it very carefully, is less the issue than how the customers perceive the quality. And in a sense, perceived quality, what people think about the quality, is more important than the technical details. And that's that's definitely the case. And it's it's the feeling and the impressions you get more than the hard data. And it, it's, uh, it's actually kind of bizarre in the auto industry today, some of the companies who have the reputation for being the highest quality actually have really, really lousy quality numbers. But the feeling that people have to drive and own those cars is, is really good. That's, that's, that's what's really important. So what we're trying to do is sort of apply that in reliability space instead of quality space. We're after perceived reliability. And this idea of being able to predict problems before they inconvenience the owners of the vehicles is, is one of the key mechanisms to do that. So that's the kind of thing that uh, we're uh, working on. So um, maybe going on too long, and I want to get to questions. So I have. One more thing I want to do, and then I'll open it up to questions. So uh, this is part of my experiment too, but uh, at one point I wrote down uh, sort of 10 
lessons. This was intended for managers, but I think it's also good for team members too. So perhaps anybody can use it. These are the 10 things that at one point in my life I thought were like the most important observations I could remember uh, over the course of my 40 years or so. So uh, first one, uh, there's a saying that if you need help, you should seek out a busy person. And the, the, the point I want to make is that when people come to you and ask for your help, they'll do it at a time when it's not convenient and you're busy, but it's really, really worth it to take the time to help that person. And the feeling of satisfaction you'll get for doing that, even when it's at an inconvenient time, I think uh, is an important point. And if you do it, you'll not only feel good about it, but you're going to be richly rewarded for that many years into the future. Second one, somewhat related, uh, you should try to be a mentor to some of the people around you by spending quality time with them. And mentoring needs to be two-way. You, you have to learn from them to be able to be effective at giving them advice. Uh, uh, same sort of thing works in a tutoring situation. The, the situations in my life, particularly when I was a student, when I had a chance to tutor people, I never learned the subject as well as when I try to teach somebody else how to do it. And those of you who are teaching, I'm sure, you know that far better than I. Um, item number three, remember that praise costs nothing and is infinitely abundant. So don't be so tight-fisted with praise. You don't want to give people praise if they haven't really done a good job, but when all around you every day, you see people who are doing a really good job, maybe a great job at different things, and you just walk by. Don't walk by. You can apply a little phrase. It's free. And if you run out, you can create more. You know, and it, and it has a great, great impact. So think about that, because I'm sure you see people every day doing that. Uh, I think it's really important. Number four, promote social functions and to build team spirit. We've done lots of things in the group. I remember, and Sam will remember, uh, we had a group called International Cuisine Committee where we went to different ethnic restaurants. We had uh, potluck type parties, which were easy to put on, inexpensive, and create these friendship bonds that will last for many decades, and seek, seek out those opportunities. Uh, number five, um, communicate, communicate, communicate. Visions, goals, changes. Uh, it's something you really can't overdo, and people don't do that very well, particularly if you're in a management role. You just need to do that, and you need to do it more than you think you need to do it, because people just need that. Um, when you're thinking about visions and goals, um, this is a little bit of a diversion, but one of the vice presidents I worked for used to say, if you really want to understand what's important about uh, visions and missions and objectives, really only have to ask four questions and the, the four key areas this applies certainly to automotive but I think to most businesses and most situations if you adapt a little bit but he said cost quality fast and great that cost is important quality is important being able to do it fast is important and having a great product that you're going to market is important and if you take those four you can transform almost any good vision and mission statements you'll see to cover those areas. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's my checklist I use when I'm trying to say, is that list or is that goal a, a good one? Does it cover those four areas? Um, okay, number six. Uh, never publicly correct an employer or associate, uh, no matter what they do. It, it's, it, if you publicly correct somebody, it's virtually guaranteed not to accomplish the goal that you had, and it's virtually guaranteed to cause all kinds of negative consequences. So you just got to like stifle yourself and then wait for a separate time later when it's private and you can tell that, that person what it is and uh, sort of think before you speak. Here's a corollary to that one too. Number seven, this one's really hard to do. Never say anything negative about another person can't say something good about the person, just be quiet. Now, 
I realize that's really hard and it's really tempting. And sometimes you see somebody do something you think is really stupid uh, and you just can hardly contain yourself from poking fun at it. Um, the, the story I have is I had a boss once, this is one of my first bosses, and he, he lived that. I, I saw him live that. And I saw other people make fun of certain people who were maybe, uh, you know, they had certain idiosyncrasies and they did things in funny ways. And he would only say good things. And if he had nothing good to say, he'd be quiet. And, and what, I, what I observed over time is that the trust that that built up and everybody he knew, everybody trusted him. And they knew he wasn't going to badmouth them or, you know, sort of knife them in the back of their situations because they knew that, that was part of his personality. And that's your chance to show it. So you have this huge win with the, the people that you're dealing with if you can just force yourself not to do that. And then you have this uh, growing uh, benefit from this that will last you a lifetime. So I was never as good at that as he was, but I, I really was impressed how, uh, how well that worked. And I encourage you to think about that. Uh, Number eight, never respond in anger. You know, lots of times you know, things will happen, you'll know, get uh, upset and angry. Not a good time to go talk to somebody about it. You need to sort of step back, compose yourself, and do that offline. Uh, number nine, this is an interesting one. Uh, never assume that another person who is causing some kind of problem in your life understands the implications for you. So let me give you a personal example. I once had a secretary who had like a personality conflict with my boss's secretary. And it was so bad that it made it really hard for me to do my job because she basically couldn't talk to my boss's secretary without you know, this confrontational aspect. And the thing that shocked me, and I remember to this very day, and why I'm telling you the story, one day by accident, not because I had any great genius about this, but I, I sat down quietly and I told her, because of this communication problem that she had with this other person, here's the impact it has on me and my job. And to my shock to this day, the problem like disappeared immediately and never came back ever again. And the lesson I learned is that people just don't see it that way. They don't think. You know, they'll be doing things that may be causing you problems in various ways, but they just don't understand because they live in the, they're living in their own world, they see it from their own perspective. If you just take the time in a non-threatening, sort of quiet, open way and explain this other perspective to them, sometimes that's all it takes. And in this particular case, you know, honest to God, it was, that problem was gone. It just was gone. And it was just taking the time to say it. And the last one is that, uh, number 10, uh, planning and managing are good things to do, but nothing works like passion. So the, uh, the guy who was uh, Sam and I's original boss, some of you may know, because I know he spent some time at Oakland University, George Dodd, he was the head of the computer science research group at GM for a long, long time. And after he retired, he said, something that impressed me a lot. He said, of all the projects in his whole career, the only ones that ever accomplished anything really important were the ones that were not directed from management top down and managed every detail. They were the ones that came from the bottom up where people who had a passion for an idea were given the freedom to pursue it and they pursued their own passion, their own dreams. And those were all of the winners were that win. And that was sort of shocking to him, and I think that's uh, an opportunity for us, too, to, to seek that passion and nurture that passion in the other people we work with and that we uh, interchange uh, things with. So those are my uh, uh, top ten ideas. So I've talked for an awfully long time. I apologize for that. Uh, I'll stop now, and I will answer any questions you might have. Yes, sir. How do you how do you spell Hadelmeyer?
Hail Mary. How do you spell it? Um, H E I L. M E I E L. Here's the. H E I L M E I E R. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Actually, the, if you go to the internet, you'll find um, different variants of that. I, I've seen like a half a dozen different variants, but they're all of the same theme. And it, it is, uh, you know, when, the first time you look at it, you say, well, these are, these are, maybe someone looked a little odd. They are great questions. They are from a master at innovation. If you can do that, you know, you should, anytime you give them a talk, I would recommend you try to be able to answer those questions and actually build it into the flow of your talk. And people will react very well. Okay. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Um, it sounds like you started your career on the technical side or in the technical area, and now you're back in the technical area. That's you're true. You spent the middle part in management, correct? Right. How did you keep current the technology which was developing pretty quickly over that time? Um, I probably didn't. Um, I mean, I tried. But, um, actually, I think that's a, that's a challenging problem for any, anybody. And uh, I, I think today, um, the resources available to stay current on sort of anything you want to, if you have your own sort of dedication and motivation to it, the resources are there almost for free, but I think it's, it's still not easy. And, um, you know, I, in, in some sense, uh, as you go into management, you don't have to stay as current with all the technical details because you have all these uh, uh, great younger people who can sort of do that for you. And I benefited greatly from that in many of the things that were successful that I was involved in. It's pretty, these teams of the right people, and, and I think the example here of the, for, the, for the faculty member who's got really bright uh, PhD students, that provides that same freshness and insight. So I think that's, whether you're in a, a business environment or an academic environment, staying close to the, the, the young people that are doing the new things, that's one way to it really, it's practical and makes a difference, and then I think being able to take advantage of some of the things that are available is important, but you got to be motivated to do that too. So um, I don't, I don't claim to have be an expert at that, but uh, it's which, uh, which it's, it's, it's at least fun. the area, this the whole computer science area. I think it was fun, right? So um, perhaps um, from a career point of view, if you're in something that you regard as fun as opposed to drudgery or work. That's a big advantage too because you know, it helps. Which which do you consider more fun, the management side or the, or the technical side? <clears throat> um, I really like them both, and they're they're really different. So the the difference uh, the difference in management is that uh, you can command more resources and take on bigger things. And um, I think in a, in a sense. If you're an individual researcher, you can do that too through by creating a team around yourself. You don't necessarily have to be their boss to get them on board with what you want to do. But I like I like them both, and I, I've always thought of it as a, as a fun area. Ma management is certainly uh, really different. Uh, this is really out of place now. But one thing one of the things I had meant to mention that I know I didn't mention now is that. When you go into a management role, one of the things you'll see is that the people around you have some really serious problems in their lives. It is invisible to the, most of the people in the room, but if you're their boss, you're going to find out. So I, I lived my early management days in a very rarefied atmosphere of extremely highly educated, really bright people great colleges, and even in that environment, there were people who had problems with uh, alcohol, with, uh, with drugs, with uh, you know, some mental health issues. And the thing that shocked me is that nobody, or almost nobody, would be aware of those things. And you see this all from management. So it's, uh, 
I, I take a lesson from that, though, that whether you see it or not, you know, in this room, there are people who are struggling with problems. And you need to, you maybe not, aren't going to know those unless you're their boss and they have to tell you or you have to learn it some way. But nevertheless, it's there. And if you recognize that people at different points in their lives will be struggling with different things, and these are the people you're going to interact with every day, if you see them do something that looks a little odd, give them a break, you know. But don't, don't jump on them for that. You know, go lean back a little bit, be cool about that, and you know, come back to the topic maybe a day later because uh, that, that, is, that is the case. There are lots of difficult problems that people are facing with and they come and go throughout their lives and uh, you won't be aware of it unless you're in a management role. But trust me, it's there. Um, I had two questions. One uh, was in terms of you were talking about manufacturing um, and perceived uh, you know reliability. Um, yep. I was wondering. I, I kind of was a little bit, but do I have this right? Um, you, so um, not not necessarily focusing on something like uh, fuel efficiency or trying to improve fuel efficiency, but trying to um, make the car do something to so that the user will you know, some perceived problem that the user has uh, of the car. So trying to solve it like, sort of like that, or? Um, it's in this, uh, I think about it in the spirit of this uh, paradigm of real-time optimization of making use of information that's available to you. But in the case of a car, uh, we have a toy example of prognosis in GM cars today that we tell you when it's time to change your oil. For some of our vehicles, it'll go out 12, 13,000 miles before it tells you to change the vehicle. It depends on the vehicle and it depends on the way you drive it. If you drive all short city driving, it's different than if you drive highway driving and all that. So that's kind of prognostic, but that's like trivial prognostics because it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's very conservative. We don't have to be very accurate. We're just trying to, you know, save a valuable resource and save a little of your time and aggravation from unnecessarily changing your oil. But the kind of things that we're after with the project I'm involved in now is for the critical systems of the vehicle. So things like the starting system, the steering system, the braking system, the ride control system, those critical systems, we want to be able to predict problems in those systems before they inconvenience you. Because some of the problems, like if you, <coughs> you know, we, 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 we believe and we've pretty much proven to ourselves now that many of the problems that happen can be tracked over time if you if you just look for it. And eventually some of these things are going to break anyway. I mean, that's life, right? But if you can uh, do something about it before it causes a problem, you've sort of taken that out of the equation. And from the customer's point of view, their perceived reliability impression will go way up. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of thing we're after. And the second question was, um, we recently had a talk here about um, something called HyperNeat, which is a... HyperNeat? Yeah, HyperNeat. HyperNeat. Yeah, it's a reconfigurable uh, neural networks where they can, you know, you use a generic algorithm to basically able to reconfigure a neural network uh, programmatically. Mm -hmm. And so you can, like, teach behaviors to different things. Do you see maybe you could use that to uh, sort of, like, to improve, uh, like, um, customer perceived reliability at all, or possibly? I don't know anything about paper need. Okay. So um, I can't comment on that particularly. Um, when we look at um, prognostic algorithms, mm -hmm. um, one of my bosses, um, well, in, in the manufacturing space, we did what we call black box solutions. We had extremely complex plants that would defy simulations of any reasonable kind. They're just really big, really complex. And we did sort of black box solutions that were able to predict when certain machines would go down. And uh, we found that by using perhaps, you know, 10 different ways that for certain machines, one way would work for this one, for another one, a different way would work. But if you studied the history files, you could actually find out which worked in which cases and do really well. So that the idea of these black box predictions, which is sort of like the neural network, where you don't have a physical understanding or an engineering understanding, is enormously appealing. And it actually works in some places, which is cool too. Uh, but in, mostly in the car, we found 
that uh, doesn't work so well, primarily because we can't get the rich data streams we need to create the models that we need. It's just, there's so much data, and there's so many vehicles, and so many variants, we, we found it difficult to do that. But we differentiate between, say, the black box or data-driven approach, which neural networks is a nice example of, or the white box, the engineering approach. And we've come to think that for our case, is what we've looked at, we need to be more white box, more engineering or physics based, but we still need some of that data. So we end up kind of like gray box, we use that term gray box somewhere between the white and the black box. And I guess my conclusion is that if you really want it to work in real life, you almost always end up in the gray box in that situation. You can start with data and get some kind of system that's working and then try to apply some physical meaning to that and get into this gray area. Or you can start with the physics and then go get data and work the other way. But you, you tend to end up in the gray in-between area anyway. It's, it's the, combining the best of both worlds. So, I, I'm, so I'm a big fan of the data-driven approach, but it doesn't work everywhere. But it certainly does work. The first of all, the presentation was very, very interesting. You covered more things than what I expected. Um, I really like the tips and lessons. But as a recipient of an award-winning thesis, can you give tips and lessons on how to write an award-winning thesis? <clears throat> um, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to, what to say. I mean, I. I I mentioned things like going out and talking to people with the real problems, uh, uh, going to talk to companies that you think might not talk to you, um, looking, uh, you know, those, those, those tips and techniques are relevant, I think, in that. They're little pieces of the pie. And uh, I guess the most important one to me is to try to connect to the real world. In almost anything that you imagine doing, there's probably some people out there doing something similar to that with maybe less good tools or approaches that are probably well worth talking to. And uh, you know, lately I, I just personally had the experience of going with a group of people out to talk to actual GM customers. They weren't actually GM, they were automotive customers, they weren't necessarily GM customers, but we actually went to their house and into their car and ask them questions while they were actually driving places. And uh, it's sort of incredible. I mean, if, if when I, when I uh, got signed up to do that, I you know, wasn't very optimistic that was going to be helpful. But it's incredibly helpful. I mean, it's amazing. If, if you put people in a situation where they're talking about some area, and you just stop talking and let them talk, and write down what they're saying and thinking as they're experiencing this, it's really, really powerful. So you know, perhaps there's a way to apply that. I'm struggling with the better answer. Sorry. <laughs> and another thing you mentioned early on, you worked on one of the first uh, relational databases. Which what, what was the name of that? It was called, it was, uh, it was a guy, uh, E. Kevin M. Whitney, V without a period. His first name was V. So it was kind of a unique guy. Um, he, he worked uh, with the pre-relational databases when he was getting his PhD, and then he had this idea for relational databases. And he called it RDMS, and it was only used for our relational database family. It's a very creative name. Um, and it was only used inside the GM, to my knowledge. And uh, not long after he did that, there was all kinds of commercial implementations that started to spring up for that. You know, for me, it was uh, before I'd ever even heard of the word, and I got assigned to him, and, and I was writing software routines that did part of that, which uh, uh, it was just an interesting experience. What year was that? That would have been um, probably like 72, 71, 72. <laughs> When you, when you interview PhDs for jobs, yeah. what kinds of things do you see, I mean, like technical gaps that you think that they would like them to have, or personality gaps? 
that you think, you know, would be nice if this would be a great guy, except he doesn't have X. You know, what kinds of things uh, would, would make a person stand out that, that conceivably we could work on? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think the, uh, the, the being able to present things without the jargon at the, at the high level and uh, be able to introduce the concept and get everybody on the same page because uh, I, I, I find when uh, PhD people come in that I've been involved in the interview, um, they're probably really, really deep in one little area that I might not know about and maybe other people in the room don't know either. So if you want to like collect the people up and get them on your wavelength, you have to introduce things in a way that sets that up and then um, rather than try to show all the formulas which becomes uh, not very communicative um, it's, it's good to go down a, and give some examples some deep examples to illustrate the technological part and, and even the formulas at some level of detail but keep it narrow to illustrate the idea so I think it's just trying to like understand your audience so you can communicate well with your audience. You know, the GM and most big companies use these systems these days where um, I, I think you'll find this in almost any company, but certainly big companies love this system where they create a situation where they there's some kind of problem and then they ask you, well, what are you going to do? They're looking for they are not looking for creative on the fly answers. What they're looking for is actual situational experience where you can quote something you actually did and you, you score the best or you do the best if you can pin it to a real example with real people in a real situation. So um, a tip for doing well in interviews is to think about you know difficult problems you've had in life in any aspect of your life with any kind of people or situation and think about you know how do you handle that because that um, approaching problems with a rational perspective and going through to a solution in an orderly way with a real example is very compelling in that situation whereas if you make it up on the fly that's very uncompelling and looks like you either hiding something or you don't really have you know any examples which mean everybody's got examples where things didn't go right so do you find that a lot of people don't have real examples at all? Yeah, I find, I find people um, sometimes will try to uh, make up uh, a sort of pseudo-logical way they'd approach it, but they're not putting in uh, the real world example which gives you confidence that they actually did it that way, respond that way. Okay, well, guys, thank you very much. <clears throat>